It feels like a long time since The Last of Us Part 2 split gaming opinions, but the conversation has endured, not least because it isn't settled, but also because the BAFTAs recently occurred, temporarily reigniting the debate again. It didn't win best game, and considering the quality and reception of the winner, Hades, by the brilliant Supergiant, that's no surprise. Hades is a game of rare quality, with none of the polarising content present in the subject of this essay, and also without the endless stories of worker exploitation that have emerged from every AAA developer. So I write this essay with the caveat that every AAA game should have, that it was made under toxic conditions, that management seemed to treat as a mere fact of life, or, more pretentiously, the cost of art, when actually it is nothing more than a failure of management, and the product of avarice on the part of the executives. And if you think that's just my opinion, man, then just look at the game that did win best game at the BAFTAs. Supergiant beat Naughty Dog, and Supergiant don't crunch. It's a choice. It's always a choice. Never, ever, mistake worker exploitation for artistic passion. Now that I've addressed that important issue, I want to tell you the reason why I feel the need to write this essay, despite the game's problematic manufacture, and it is this. For all of the dialogue about The Last of Us Part 2, and by Jingo there is a lot, there is always a huge and essential part of the discourse just missing, and frankly I cannot believe it has been left to me to fill in the gaps. For each side, the narrative is either hugely disappointing or enormously satisfying, but neither are ever able to make a credible case either way. They just think it makes sense or it doesn't, and on one side you have these characters are illogical, and on the other you just have game reviewers reaching for their shiniest adjectives, but failing to truly express themselves or what the game is. So here I am, and I am going to tell you what the fuck is what. I'm going to break this shit down for you so you understand how it works, and not just that I think it does. Spoken through another 500 redundant superlatives, how it works. We're getting right under the hood with this one. So here's your spoiler warning, turn this shit off right now. This is for people who played this game, to look at it in a new light. Not for people who haven't played it, if you haven't, pause this, go complete it, roll the credits properly, all the way to the end, then come back to me. About what we were talking about earlier. Okay, firstly, let's get the inclusivity bullshit out of the way. Here's a few bottom lines, if you will. If you dislike the game because it makes you play as a lesbian who falls in love with a pregnant Jew, and then it has the audacity to make you play as a girl with bigger triceps than you have, you piss-weak dweeb, and she killed your white saviour avatar, then do me a favour. You get right in those comments and spew all the worst shit you can think of. Really show us your true colours. I don't give a fuck, it only drives traffic. You get to feel like your life isn't a meaningless procession of things you don't understand until you die never having progressed emotionally past puberty, and I get more visibility on my channel. Everyone's a winner. If your views are less fucking juvenile, but you're still disappointed that you can't play as Joel, aka mighty white mass murderer and world's most prolific hope destroyer, then you have sorely, sorely misjudged the morality of this game. I assure you, your attachment to Joel is your problem, not Naughty Dog's. This brings me to the first and most telling misjudgment of The Last of Us 2. When I first heard the dissent about The Last of Us Part 2 after the plot leaks but before anyone had played the thing, I assumed, whilst avoiding spoilers mostly, it was mainly about Joel, because after what he did in the first game, for the record murdering mankind's only hope of recovery and slaughtering in a prolonged unspeakable rampage the only force for good in the entire game world, and doing it in a fucking hospital, I assumed he was going to have to pay for it. There was no way that act wasn't going to have consequences. I was right, and that anyone was in the least bit surprised baffled me. I half thought that Ellie herself might do it. This man has gone so far wrong that putting him down could be the only conclusion. And if you still want to play as him and murder some more people, consequence free in the name of misguided fatherly love, then you need to ask yourself some questions about your own morality. You see, this game may have some blunt mechanical similarities to Gears of War, or indeed Uncharted, but as a complete game it could not be further from the slaughter porn brofest or the charming action saga. 
So disabuse yourself of a traditional gaming mindset and let the game tell you what it is. Judge it by what you can see and do, not by your expectations. Believe it or not, game developers might have had a thought you haven't had yet. You see, what Epic did with Gears of War was give you a clear and simple objective. Shoot the boogans. The boogans are bad. And it does not deviate. And by Gears 3, it makes the boogans explode in a super satisfying and snotty looking way. The game is pure catharsis and never tries to be anything else. But The Last of Us modified those motivations. And in doing so, it gave us a continual moral tension between catharsis and compassion. Even the weaker boogans, the runners, look and sound just like tortured humans. And consequently, killing them still feels uncomfortable. Even after you've watched them beat Joel to death 50 times because you foolishly tried for the platinum and Jesus fucking Christ. So at the beginning of the game proper, we're asked to go with Joel, Jess and Ellie as they engage in mortal combat with humans. Just other humans, same as them. Not only that, Joel admits later that he was in fact on the other side of this fight once. He was what is known in the game as a hunter. A hunter being one that hunts other humans. Just think about that for a second. He was once a man who would set traps for travellers and shoot on sight. Women, children didn't matter. They'd hunt them down and murder them for their stuff. He did that. Now we can't truly know what the end of the civilised world will do to anyone. But however provoked, Joel still did that. And it isn't long before we find that he is far from reformed. Still miss him? Still miss that lovable ruffian? With a heart so big he'll damn the world to perdition for a single girl? Whose opinion, I might add, he never asked for. Heaven forfend she gets to decide whether to save the human race or not. No, surrogate dad the one man Blitzkrieg knows best. I understand this might sound as if I don't like The Last of Us Part 1. Far from it. I love it. Finding out you're the villain in a video game is one of the best things you can do. Some of the most critically acclaimed games of the last decade did exactly this. Braid has a breathtaking denouement, and Spec Ops The Line is a cult classic and a game talked about so effusively it's nauseating. And I'm the one doing it. I make myself sick talking about how good that game is. The difference between those examples and The Last of Us Part 1 is that it doesn't tell you. It just slowly pulls you into a story and culminates in you, Joel, murdering the saviours of the human race and, let's not forget, executing a wounded leader pleading for her life and kind of expects you to figure it out yourself. In retrospect, a naive artistic decision because it seems half the people who played and loved The Last of Us didn't notice. So when Joel got what was coming to him in The Last of Us Part 2, they were both surprised and dismayed at the loss of their hero. Yes, hero. Can you even hear yourselves? So we find that we are in a world of post-morality. There is no social contract. Barbarism reigns, and as such, Joel and Ellie are continually forced into an us-or-them paradigm. The us or them paradigm and the tension between catharsis and compassion is fundamental to the action of both games and becomes the narrative linchpin in The Last of Us 2, but we'll get to that. The motivations to perform the actions necessary to advance the plot become notably more complicated in the sequel. What this led to is criticism regarding character logic, but, and I'll explain why in exhaustive detail, the character logic is rock fucking solid. It is completely consistent with the world, the characters' histories, and most importantly, the moral core of the work of art as a whole, and the universal philosophy that it expresses, and I will explain that too. The mistake that is made when one feels a disconnect between themselves and the characters is to assume that it's a fault of the game. It isn't. It isn't because the characters stopped being consistent. It lies in our egos. One of the greatest and most important things about games is the vicarious experience, but it isn't thought about in a very sophisticated way. It is almost always approached with the focus on player behaviour. But that is just what we do, not how we experience games. Little is made of the duality of that experience. 
We are not just protagonists. We are witnesses. So when someone says, I hate that Ellie kept killing people. I tried to get through the game killing as few as possible. Which I have heard from real people that I know. Their criticism is completely misdirected. They've mistaken Ellie for themselves. The game catches them in the us or them paradigm. But at the same time, the compassion catharsis tension is out of balance. The player feels compassion, but the character wants catharsis. This is not a mistake, but by design. The player then has to accept that actually they aren't in control of this story. Ellie doesn't give a fuck what you think of her. And she doesn't care that she needs you to help her. She just wants revenge. And it is the same with Abby. In a world where the only justice is that which you can exact, and more importantly judge yourself, a world governed entirely by the power of violence, this is the crystal clear result of the pursuit of it. Both axes are legitimate, and Ellie and Abby grind them to dust, as did Joel. The infected are, as with Romero zombies, just reflections of our corrupted ids, unfiltered and without mercy. How much like them humans have become is, well, kind of the point of the whole franchise. To assume you as the player and a human, I might add, are not part of that is the problem. So here is the solution. Do not resist the darkness. Do not wring your hands at every unavoidable neck snap. Do not think that you are so morally grounded that you could never associate with the darkness in this game. Experiencing that darkness is entirely the point of it. If you can empathise with the unwitting militia you have to slaughter, you can empathise with the killer. I know that this isn't an easy ride, but why do games always have to make you feel nice? You want nice eat a pizza. Art cannot function unless it has the freedom to express bleakness as well as splendour. Art has a responsibility to express the full gamut of the human experience. And yes, games are allowed to evoke complex emotions, even dark ones. Believe it or not, it makes them better, not worse. This is all to address a central criticism of the game that has come from a lot of reviewers, some reviewers that I respect greatly, and it amounts to this. What is this I am feeling? Where's my unqualified catharsis? This does not meet my juvenile expectations. Why can't I just have fun? To which I say, grow up. Games did, why don't you? Nobody judges any other art form in that manner. No one says that Schindler's List is shit because it isn't two and a half hours of rip-roaring fun. Nobody says Cormac McCarthy's The Road is a bad book because it isn't a rollicking page-turner and a bag of laughs to boot. And yes, I did pick those two examples deliberately. The fundamental principle that Jim Sterling and Yahtzee Croshaw, both of which I have boundless love and respect for, need to connect with, is that the reasons you've given to not like this game not only aren't objective, but they fail to acknowledge the duality that the game has pinned its story on. Ambivalence is to be coveted, not rejected in confusion. Not everyone likes The Road or Schindler's List. They're fucking hard going. But that's not Spielberg's problem, neither is it McCarthy's. They made some good art that is hard for some people. Not everyone wants it in their lives, and fair enough. But don't think it isn't anything but a matter of taste. We're all years past respecting the opinion of someone who says they don't like Radiohead because their music is depressing. And if we read that in the NME, we'd wonder how on earth it got printed and who let their niece write the review. So games media, do me a favour. Align your expectations of games with your expectations of everything else you consume with your eyes and ears. You think they're different, but they aren't. I just need to add a caveat that I think Schindler's List is overrated. It's very serious and very worthy and earnestly made and an important cultural document in its own way. But it isn't a masterpiece. All biopics are hamstrung by the fact they are based on real things. Few ever transcend their subject and say anything more than this happened. Which, nevertheless, in the case of Schindler's List, is an important thing to say. I just didn't want anyone to think that I thought Schindler's List was my favourite film or anything. It isn't. Spielberg's best film is Jaws. I could live without literally everything else he ever made. Although I do like Duel, 
E.T. can eat a dick. Oh, and if you want a genuinely transcendent biopic, watch I, Tonya. Oh, and Bernie. Bernie is great. So as I said at the beginning, no one has made a solid case for The Last of Us Part 2's objective quality either way. So that first half was addressing the criticisms levelled at the game, which I have always felt were facile. So with those deconstructed and thoroughly debunked, now I have to make the case to the contrary. I am a writer by vocation, not a journalist, not a critic, but a playwright. It has been my study for years to understand the nuts and bolts and real craft of storytelling, through drama in particular, and I have always approached games with the same critical eye that I approach other dramatic storytelling mediums. This leaves me well placed to dig deep into the workings of The Last of Us Part 2 to show you its guts and expose its value. And you might say that games are more than just drama and story. What have you got to say about the mechanics and level design and the animation and handling? Well, plenty. But it's all praise, really. Let's remember that 90% of the dialogue about this game is not about any of that. And that is in part because most of it is unassailably brilliant. And there really isn't much debate about that. It's an incredibly well-crafted game. The only people complaining about length or pacing are the same people that complained of not having enough fun. One clearly informs the other, and we've addressed that already. So why is this game a masterpiece? A masterpiece is a work of art that excels in every practical respect, but more importantly achieves something not yet achieved. Something of unique value. A landmark. And this is where we start and end our argument. It is a rare occurrence that any game reaches so deeply for the profound. That's not to say that there aren't great and successful attempts to plumb the depths of the human experience. But I've never known a game to ruminate so successfully on that which defined and continues to define modern AAA games. And most games, in fact. Violence. Now, when Neil Druckmann pitched this game to the suits upstairs at Sony, I'm pretty sure he didn't say, I'm going to make a revenge tragedy that takes a giant spiral of violence to its vanishing point and leaves the protagonist with nothing and no one. But that is damn sure what he delivered. I'm almost completely convinced that The Last of Us, as a concept, was born out of the desire for a dramatic tone shift at Naughty Dog. Uncharted was enjoying enormous success and critical acclaim, but something rankled with the creative minds in the office. Ludo-narrative dissonance. Clint Hocking coined the phrase, citing Uncharted as a prime example of a game whose action does not marry with its story. The primary gameplay loop of killing people is at odds with the whole game's lighter, more human, heartfelt tone. In this way, the game and the story are dissonant. He was right. I never cared, I was having too much fun, but Clint was right. The Last of Us seemed to me a conclusive answer to the criticism. Suddenly Naughty Dog were taking violence seriously, creating a world that required it and not only that, refused to deny the horror of it. The violence now had an emotional weight that no game had achieved before. A game with a cycle of violence shot through with endless regret, until the end where a franchise defining choice was made. In St Mary's Hospital, Salt Lake City, with the revelation of Ellie's impending sacrifice, after a life of endless violence and unspeakable trauma, Joel has to choose between violence and compassion. But that compassion has an unthinkable cost for him. So does he keep fighting, or face his infinite grief? Of course he chose the fight, of course he turned away from his grief, of course he slaughtered every single one of those bastards, because not again, not again, not again. The depiction of an atrocity committed in the name of unspeakable grief is, as Robert McKee puts it, the negation of the negation. The perfect moment of crisis where the darkest ironies are found. What Joel created in that moment made every event of part two inevitable. An explosion of collateral damage causing exponential amounts of grief, all because he couldn't face his own. Joel's choice does not only affect the fate of the fireflies and the human race as a whole, but in saving Ellie, he changes her. Time and time again throughout part two, Ellie has a choice between catharsis and compassion, and time and time again she chooses catharsis. So many times her hand has been forced, caught in the us or them paradigm, just like Joel was. 
To her, there only ever seems to be one choice. Even when there's two, Ellie is not an avenging angel. She is Joel. His grief lives through her, and she is no better equipped to face her grief and heal than he was. And this isn't reaching for motivation. It's as good as spoken. Ellie tells Tommy in the aftermath of Joel's death, if it were you or me, Joel would be halfway to Seattle already. She must do as Joel would. And Tommy plays a part in the corruption of Ellie too, when Ellie and Dina discover the two tortured bodies in the hotel room on day one in Seattle, Ellie knows it's Tommy's work. But this is the first time she's witnessed it firsthand. Far from turning away from it though, she accepts it as necessary, and it becomes an ugly portent of what she is going to become. Prior to that, she has casually suggested she would torture someone. In the courthouse, they talk about jury service, and Ellie says, just give me five minutes and my knife. A statement that makes Dina obviously uncomfortable and foreshadows the coming test. It is at this point that I really want to point out that this level of character detail, especially achieved in a game of this nature, is unheard of. What I have just described is a single, small, but essential beat at the beginning of Act 2 of a story of enormous magnitude. How many games have a protagonist that changes at all from beginning to end? And in the ones that do, how many of them plot a character arc in such detail? I'll tell you, none. Have at it in the comments. By the time Ellie has killed every one of Abby's friends, her transformation is complete and every dark choice she made to get there has made a villain out of her. Frankly, a fucking super villain. And no, I did not want to press square to beat Nora over the head, but I did it. Because this isn't my story, it's Ellie's, and I will witness it, and I will participate in it, I will implicate myself in it, and I will take responsibility for how it makes me feel. Because that is what art made in good faith deserves. It's literally the whole point of making it. These stories experienced in the unique, vicarious way that only video games can provide, can teach us things about ourselves that we hadn't a hope of realising otherwise. Noted fetishist, philosopher and Bastille resident, the Marquis de Sade wrote, very roughly speaking, that to truly know darkness you had to become it. If only he had had video games, he'd probably have never been arrested. It is so obvious now why. When Abby and Ellie finally meet again in the theatre, we do not get to fight as Ellie. It would be obscene to give Abby such short shrift. By finally switching perspectives, in that standoff, we see Ellie for the terrifying and deadly monster she has become. And Abby rebukes her for it. We let you live, and you wasted it. Now we need to talk about Abby, whose actor Laura Bailey did win a BAFTA. Abby provides the example Ellie needs to find a tiny shaft of light in the deep, dark abyss of her story. Abby represents Joel even more obviously than Ellie, but it is a version of Joel that found a moral compass that Ellie never provided for him. Lev is the key to the light in Abby, and the pair's alliance is the moral core of the story. Abby's world-shattering arrival throws into greater relief that which motivates the violence. Grief. And more importantly, shows us a path beyond the spiral of revenge. One that Ellie only finds all too late. I would like now to address those who think this both sides approach is somehow trite. It would be trite if it was executed in a blunt, naive and broad way, like Another Day in Paradise by Phil Collins, for example. But this, this isn't trite because it isn't broad. It isn't a tumbler post. It is sharp and nuanced and far from naive. To suggest that manifesting a story in which violence leads to violence is naive is itself a negation of the negation. The story carries with it a degree of pessimism, even cynicism, but anyone who fails to identify with that needs to look out the window while watch the news now and again. And I might add, a position like that can only be held with the assumption that this game is the end of the story. It obviously isn't. But I'll talk about that later. Anyway, back to Abby. 
The first thing we see after she confronts Ellie in the theatre is the prelude to the Big Bang event that made all this happen. She is a child, utterly disempowered, and her desperate, helpless wails as she looks on at her murdered father is the most important image in the game, because this is what grief means. It is the purest, clearest and most concentrated manifestation of helplessness. Pure pain with no remedy. Everything that Abby becomes from that point on is because of this event. She strives relentlessly to become the opposite of how she felt in that moment. Her mind and body and indeed life become perfect representations of empowerment. I quote Isaac's top scar killer. You wonder why her arms are so big? This is why. And this is where the real value of this story presents itself. The game is a story told through violence, but really it's about the grief that drives it. In her next pivotal moment, she is transformed into a soldier on a mission of revenge, and her brutal torture and murder of Joel is a moment where Abby chooses, without hesitation, catharsis over compassion. Just like Joel. And just like Joel, the catharsis, the violence, is just a proxy for grief. Rather than a conduit, it shields her. It's a painkiller. And of course, Ellie's interruption of her in the act is no coincidence. She gets to feel the ego-destroying impotence of grief, just as Abby did. The sins of the father are visited upon the children. So if grief is what the story is really about, what does it have to say about it? This is where Abby's story with Lev is most important. And when viewed through the lens of grief, Abby shows an extraordinary dichotomy. Because whilst the perpetrator of the game's most gruesome and cruel act, she becomes an example of redemption, more than once. After the death of her father, the fireflies disband, and she does the best thing one can do when one loses their family. She finds a new one, and of course trains to become a protector of that family. Because not again. After her murder of Joel, Ellie arrives and destroys that family too. She is left alone again, but for Lev. From that point on, it is Abby and Lev, her new family. Twice it is torn away, and twice she rebuilds. And this new partnership is not simply for aesthetic symmetry or of convenience. Abby lets Lev in. She lets the flickering light of family draw her back from the edge of vengeful oblivion. All the more extraordinary when Lev's own story is taken into account. The victim of violent prejudice that caused the death of his family, one of them at his own hands, when he is once again caught in the us or them paradigm. When Abby has a knife at Dina's throat, there is only one thing that stops her, and it is Lev. Lev who could misdirect his own pain, pursue catharsis vicariously through Abby, but no. Lev is the true light in the darkest of stories, the one who realised early that no peace shall be found through violence. In the final sequence, Ellie, having moved heaven and earth to find Abby, cruelly uses Lev as leverage, no pun intended, to provoke the final desperate fight. Now we finally fight Abby as Ellie. We know who will win, but we soon realise, as Ellie does, that she is fighting herself. Moments from committing a violent drowning, she finally connects with the futility of the destruction. Also the symmetry between her very first kill and this becomes apparent. As she holds Abby's head under water, we are reminded of Joel being drowned by a hunter unable to reach his weapon, and suddenly Ellie is there with a headshot. Her first kill, and the first time she saves Joel. Ellie herself recounts this story to Dina on the journey to Seattle. Now she realises that there is no version of Ellie to make the same. Lev is unconscious, she is the hunter, and suddenly it doesn't make any sense anymore. So she gives in. Finally. Finally she has realised that this was no longer the pursuit of justice. It was nothing but a tragic spiral of pain. And there she sits on the purgatorial shore with the indifferent tide washing around her 
realising that it was not Abby that cost her everything, but herself. This shows us every permutation of grief. It shows us how it manifests in anger and how it finds ways to corrupt a human. It shows us every moral argument for that which we twist into what we call justice and shows us every tragic consequence of its pursuit. Finally, and pivotally, it shows us that grief is a thing more powerful and enduring than anything that we can do. Far from being simply a catalyst, it is a universal constant. I know a bit about revenge tragedies. I've seen and read many of them, on stage, on screen and on the page. This story is as good as any of them, from Shakespeare's Hamlet to Schiller's The Robbers to Park Chan-wook's Old Boy. This has its place. I've elucidated its core message so far, but said little of its structural sophistication, which deserves recognition of its own. So this next part will cover the subject of dramatic structure, which is different from narrative structure. Narrative structure is the in-world timeline, what happens to the characters as time passes for them, with cause and effect in full flow. Dramatic structure is the order of events as we the players see them. Let's begin at the beginning. At the beginning of part two, we are shown Joel recounting his slaughter of innocence and damning of the human race to his brother Tommy, who astonishingly admits he would have done the same and vows himself to secrecy. Before, in Joel's telling, we are shown the corridor, the fateful door to the operating room, the flashing red light, the place where it happened. We are then cruelly given control of Joel in a bid to make us reconnect with him. And it works. For all his depravity, he is not a proud man. He knows his weaknesses, but neither does he regret his actions. Already on that horse ride through the forest back to Jackson, we are deeply ambivalent about the man we're riding with. Naughty Dog then doubles down on the pathos with the next scene, in which we are, for the first time, shown Joel at his most emotionally vulnerable. In his short serenade to Ellie, the murderous old dog shows us just why he did what he did. This interlude of artistry has him reaching for and touching upon a grace he knows he can never grasp. Moments later, four years have passed and we inhabit Ellie, in her, as Joseph Campbell would put it, ordinary world. But of course for our protagonist it is a fateful day. It was no accident that we saw Joel at his most lovable, most moving, so close to his demise. We know he's earned it, and we know he's not reformed, but still we do not want what we know to be true, to be true. Right up to the final blow, we're still wishing it would stop. This is the power of dramatic structure, and it does not end there. The mixing up of the timeline serves the game as a practical experience and a dramatic one, and its sophistication has been vastly underrated by those who sit on the wrong side of this fence. From a gameplay perspective, the dramatic structure helps enhance the pacing of the game in terms of its play intensity and its emotional intensity. Seattle Day 1 has an open world section that eases us into encounters with Ellie and gets us used to all of the nuts and bolts of gameplay, after which the game steps up its intensity notably. Using both distinct styles of encounter with humans and infected, and then of course, we both. After a fraught final sequence, in which Ellie and Dina barely escape the subway, we are all in need of a rest, which is precisely what we get in the birthday present sequence to follow. But this is not only to give us a nice respite. This isn't just to let us recharge our batteries, this is a vital first part in the story of how Ellie finds out the truth, and how she eventually begins to come to terms with Joel. After the morning of day two's events, in which we find ourselves trying not to kill too many dogs, and Jessie's arrival, we get another welcome respite. Two years previous, some target practice with Tommy before we are shown another step in the breakdown of Joel and Ellie's relationship. This is the chapter that shows Ellie becoming the seasoned combatant that she is, and equally so Joel's encouragement. On top of that, Joel's unwillingness to be honest, and she knows he's lying, is tacitly teaching her that she does not have to be honest either. She, with his example, is growing into just exactly the kind of person that would do what Joel did and lie about it. It is a sad fact, 
played out here that we are far more likely to repeat our parents' mistakes than to learn from them. In this chapter, whilst riding to the music store, Joel and Ellie talk about a comic book like character them? exacting a brutal oh, revenge right. on an enemy. It's not really my cup of tea, but Dr. Daniela Starr, I mean, she's pretty... She's a savage. Well, what she does to Captain Ryan in that death match. Woo. Yeah. I mean, he definitely deserved it, but... This ugly prescience can only be appreciated when the story is told in this order, unless you play it multiple times, which of course I have. It's not the greatest script editing trick, but notable nonetheless. Anyway, the greatest script editing trick is saved for last. Ellie's final flashback of this half of the game is from one hospital corridor to another. It is two years earlier. She returned to Salt Lake City to find the truth. So for the second time we're here, but as Ellie for the first. Seeing the devastation, the blood-stained floor, the dereliction, the desertion, all caused by Joel, is sobering. And it is followed by what we've been waiting for all game. The truth finally discovered and the confrontation with Joel. It follows another watershed moment for Ellie in Seattle, with an obvious parallel to Joel. We've heard her casually talk about torture, we've seen her accept its collateral damage. Now, in another test, which she passes or fails depending on your outlook, she commits torture and murder on a doctor in a hospital. Once again, it is tacitly implied that Ellie is following the same dark path of her guardian and predecessor. Upon her return to Dina, she admits that she fears what she is becoming with the simple line, I don't want to lose you. The arrangement of these flashbacks is so elegant, creating effortless connections between story beats by their placement that makes analysis a joy. Abby's half of the story uses exactly the same pacing mechanics as Ellie's and contains equally important juxtapositions. After Abby confronts Ellie in the theatre, we are immediately sucked back in time to her childhood, back to the life she would have led were it not for Joel. And here again we see the corridor. But this time it is Abby, terrified of what she will find when she opens the door to the operating room. And she finds all her worst nightmares come true. An immediate cut to her exacting revenge on the murderer is all we need to feel her catharsis. But in that room, now we can hear the dialogue. We find that with all the arguing and chaos surrounding that scene, it is Abby who wrenches back control and commits a dangerous but defining act of mercy, leaving Tommy and Ellie alive. In Seattle's day one, as with Ellie, long and extremely tense sections of gameplay are broken up by low intensity narrative scenes that show a simple key points in Abby's story. The discovery of the aquarium, the toy bow and arrow shooting range, all serving to soften us and let us relax before launching us back into the present harrowing story. Those interludes also have vital plot points. Without them, Owen and Abby's relationship is left bereft of real context and their day one encounter would make far less sense without it. What's more, the first aquarium adventure establishes precisely the link between Abby's obsession with becoming a soldier and her ultimate desire to avenge her father's murder. Day one culminates in the revelation of Owen's rejection of the WLF and plan to reconnect with what he believes is left of the Fireflies. I am tired of fighting over land I don't give a fuck about. The cracks in Abby's allegiances are laid bare in her dream on the boat in which we return once again to the hospital corridor. Only now when Abby opens the door to the operating room she is confronted with a new horror and one which drives her further from her home with the WLF and into a deeply uncomfortable morally liminal space in which everyone becomes an enemy by the children she is allied with. The repetition of the hospital beat However it changes, from whatever perspective we see it, ties all of this story together. Again and again we see the ominous walk down the corridor of the paediatric ward of St Mary's Hospital, Salt Lake City. Each time it is different, and each time it shows us a new reason that all of this is happening. It is the Big Bang that creates everything. And this time it is why Abby knows that she is not done with Lev and Yara. 
She knows what they are. They are children trying to survive. Her re-engaging with them is a confirmation not only of her broken allegiance to Isaac and the WLF, but her inability to abandon compassion. Her central objective now, as complicated as it gets, and boy howdy does it get complicated, is to help the children. Ellie spends these three days in pursuit of revenge. Abby spends these three days in pursuit of redemption. After Abby's Dante-esque descent into hell by way of the hospital basement, we return again to the corridor. Now we see an image of serenity, one that appears to provide some closure for Abby, but upon waking, her troubles are far from over. She may have found some peace with her family, but Lev has not. He needs what she does. He cannot yet give up his mother, so has stolen a boat and made for the Seraphite Island. On top of the exploding love triangle Abby finds herself in, she now is committed to these children and must face a further ordeal in their name. What this continual repetition of the corridor is doing is connecting everything Abby is and feels, good and bad, to that event. As much and as far as her story has departed from it, it all starts there. Her seeking of redemption stems directly from her seeking of revenge. She does not like what she has become. So when Mel straight up calls her a piece of shit, she does not argue. She knows she deserves it. Abby's state at this point is symmetrical to Joel's saviour complex. She is unable to abandon her children. They are her only path to redemption. But unlike Joel, she wishes to shed her barbarism. She wishes to save them when she could not save her father, as Joel could not save his daughter. It only remains to be seen how far she will go for them. The next day lays bare the already apparent toxicity and duplicitousness of the conflicting ideologies of the WLF and the Seraphites. Once both turn on Abby, the real experience of their violence is undeniable and equivalent. Both purport to espouse peace and order, but both are aggressively militaristic, expansionist and violent. And their war, as with all war, is not over philosophy or ideology, it's not over religion, it is over land. Property. The simple fact of the war exposes both sides' rhetoric for what it is, politicking for power and property. The Seraphites devoutly shun the old ways, rejecting technology, living in harmony with nature. Except when they want to keep up with the arms race, in which case assault rifles and shotguns are fine. They hang and gut people in the name of a purity espoused by a prophet and martyr who never raised a hand in anger. The WLF are no better. What they have created at the stadium has come at huge human cost and is nothing short of a dangerous military dictatorship of the same type that the WLF was established to overthrow and under the leadership of an increasingly frightening Isaac, becoming more and more paranoid, protectionist and insidious. By this time we find that Abby is pursued by both wolves and seraphites, both shooting to kill with no questions asked. We sit behind Abby, knowing the nuance of the situation, but it is all kept from her assailants. They just want her dead. This is the inevitable injustice of authoritarianism, and Abby finds herself once again caught in the us or them paradigm, with no route to compassion. The darkest irony being that compassion was precisely what brought her to this point. She confronted horrors never seen and slayed monsters from the deep for these children and this is what she gets. And by the time she returns to her one refuge with her last remaining friends, she finds them dead. Because for all her pursuit of redemption, the cost of her transgressions can only ever be paid to one woman. And all this time, Ellie has been making to collect. So here is a good moment to point out the multiple vectors of The Last of Us Part II's storytelling and world building. Every piece of environmental design, found note and line of dialogue is placed where it is for good reason. Not a shred of it is wasted. These, hand in hand with its non-linear dramatic structure, build a complete world, seen not only from two angles but many. Much of it goes to prologue the central action, almost invisibly. Take for instance the slightly jarring sexual encounter Abby and Owen have. 
It might provoke the question, why would you be doing this in a situation like that? But this type of behaviour has been prologued already, not just in their personal relationship, but in their society. Manny, Abby's friend, is the example we're given. He's a soldier. The WLF are at war on two fronts, the infected and the seraphites. Life is an enormous struggle. But he, along with his multiple partners, is prolific in his sexual activity. A little bit of extra exploration even shows you one of Manny's sex dens, complete with a dirty note left by one of his lovers. So now it's clear. Everyone is at it because why the hell not? Life is hard enough without throwing needless abstinence into the mix. Got to rebuild the human race somehow, right? That whole character point wasn't there for titillation or comedy or to add a cheap dimension to Manny's character. It was there to normalise sex. Because sex is normal. Abby's excursion onto the island is the point at which she and Lev are joined together for life. Caught in a war that both have completely detached themselves from, they lose Yara in a fateful confrontation with Isaac, who is also killed. After which Abby speaks to Lev, my favourite line in the whole game. You're my people. And from then we are thrust into the real depths of war where the brutality has no end. The fraught ride through the burning New Haven, followed by the incredible, sickeningly visceral fight with a last, giant, demonic-looking seraphite, shows us just where all this ends when there is no compromise, and gives us a dark glimpse into her possible future. The image of silhouetted executions on the docks as they escape in a rowboat are an obvious visualisation of an attempt to leave that grim violence behind. But of course Abby doesn't yet know what lies ahead. With all her friends dead, we soon return to the theatre and what is supposed to be a final confrontation. Abby kills Jesse with a reflexive shot as he bursts through the door. Once again we hear, we let you live and you've wasted it. Before chaos ensues, and Abby must pursue Ellie through the theatre. After several deathly physical altercations, Dina intervenes, but Abby overpowers her. Here is where a new defining choice is made. Once again, Abby is given the choice of compassion or catharsis. And even though she has more reason to want revenge than ever before, she is reminded by Lev that that is not what she wants to be not what she is to Lev, and once again, she chooses compassion. And she must, of course she must, otherwise her pursuit of redemption that brought her to this point will mean nothing. Yara told her she was a good person. She would not be able to look herself or Lev in the eye if she did anything else. Consider how hard her first act of revenge has been to live with. Consider what it drove her to. What more would more killing achieve other than to send her to new unfathomable depths of guilt and alienate the only person left in her life that believes in her? Once she and Lev leave, we quickly refocus on Ellie. A close-up indicates that we're with her now. And after that fight, it's a distinctly uncomfortable feeling. The woman that took everything from Abby. But there's no choice. We're with the villain now. We cut to some time later and get a view of Dina and Ellie's new life on a farm with Dina's little boy, some chickens and some sheep. They settled, but of course after spending some time wondering if the credits will roll and if we'd be satisfied if they did, Ellie's past haunts her. But instead of a hospital corridor, it's the mountain villa, the stairwell leading to a door that won't open, behind which is a screaming giant. It's not over. The post-apocalyptic world doesn't have therapy. She's going to have to do something else. This is not the end of Uncharted 4, but it is just similar enough to let you know that it isn't. So this extended fifth act, another bone of contention with the critics, serves to fully complete the moral code of this game. Regardless of the ordeal that Abby suffered in Seattle, regardless of her losing everyone and everything, and regardless of the mercy she showed in the face of it, it is clear that her penance is not complete. She must go through something that is as good as death. 
in order to be reborn, and ultimately to be forgiven her transgressions by the only person who can absolve her. Without this act, the story is broken and incomplete. In short, absolution requires everything. And if that is so for Abby, the same is true for Ellie. But it isn't even as simple as that for her. She has two stories that we need to tie up for a start. One, how she gains closure on all of her losses, redeems her morality, and reclaims her life back from the broken PTSD sufferer she has become. And two, how she reconciles with Joel before his death. Only one of these is truly concluded in the fifth act. The other we must wait for. Ellie's picturesque life is not at all what it seems. It is a confluence of necessities and dreams. When Dina and Ellie explore the bank on day one in Seattle, finding it the target of a botched robbery on outbreak day, they talk about what they do with so much money, a useless commodity in post-outbreak US. Dina says she'd buy a farm. Once returned, that dream crosses with Ellie's apparent inability to cope with living in Jackson. We find that out through reading her diary found in her study late one night. Now her uncomfortable new ordinary world is established, Tommy arrives to disrupt it further, and it leaves Ellie with a tragic ultimatum. She must choose between the life she has and seeking closure on the life she led. There is no question what she must choose. It is clear she's not able to live as she is. She doesn't sleep. This is where she makes a terrible error of observation. Her nightmares are not just grief and trauma, and killing Abby will not make them recede. Her disquiet is as much guilt as it is pain, and she is only heading off to add to the load. But there's only one person who can show her that, the person she means to kill. Before this decision is made outright, another flashback reminds us of more unfinished business. It's the night before the morning after, and everything we heard about on the morning of Joel's death is showed to us. Dina and Ellie's first kiss, the bigot Seth causing a scene, Joel intervening and what is most important, Ellie putting Joel firmly in his place and him letting her. And despite everything we now know, it makes us yearn for their reconciliation. At least with that, we could have a shred of hope for Ellie's redemption. But that feeling contains a beautiful logical fallacy that I'm saving for the finale. The next moment she's wearing Joel's jacket and preparing to make for Santa Barbara. So now we join Abby on a journey to find an old family she lost and bring Lev into it so that they can find their happy ending. They are close, their bond is strong and it is something to believe in. But what this fifth act requires after such a morally conflicted four acts is a real villain. One unequivocally morally debased, one with no redeeming ideology, with no complexity, just pure hedonistic psychopathic evil, one that causes people to say Santa Barbara is cursed. The only thing that can truly redeem a villain is a bigger villain. And finally, it gives us one. The hospital basement only looked like hell. This is the real thing. Once they are captured, it is notable that we are never shown nor told what happens to her and Lev. We only infer it from the Rattler's dialogue, coupled with how we finally find Abby and Lev. They are ghosts. By the time Ellie, on her pursuit, has to start killing them, the Rattlers have revealed themselves as pure human detritus. Scum. It is the first and only part of the game in which we gain genuine, uncomplicated moral catharsis from killing humans. After we witness an SKP from their compound kill himself rather than be captured, we don't just not mind if we have to kill these people. We really want to. We take active pleasure in slaughtering them, and of course in a twist of fate, Ellie's actions give her a strange kind of moral high ground that is at odds with her intent. She's not hunting Abby, she's saving her. She has inadvertently found herself on a crusade to rescue her nemesis. And she does. The biblical iconography at play on the beach at Santa Barbara is overt to say the least. And some clearly find it pretentious, to which I say if that is the case, so is the Bible. The climax of The Last of Us Part 2 is audacious, operatic, even melodramatic. 
but to shrug it off as sentimentality is nothing short of abject cynicism. And critics that do need to rethink what they value, and if they are even interested in art at all. One cannot, with one breath, defend video games as an art form, and with another, dismiss this as self-indulgence. I will buy any emotional payoff, no matter how intense or operatic, provided that it is earned. If it isn't clear by now that this ending is not only earned but totally inevitable, then frankly I'm astonished you're still here. You should probably go and play Fortnite. In the extraordinary final action, Ellie appears to simply be saving Abby and letting her and Lev go. An incredible, wordless act of grace. But in a jarring, silent flashback, we are reminded why they are there, together on the shore, separately preparing boats for departure. It wasn't enough for Ellie to have knowledge of Abby's penance. Not enough to witness it. Because she did not exact it. She is the bringer of retribution, not some nameless slavers. No one gets to take that from her. Abby, a different person from the one we met in Jackson or Seattle, will not fight. But that is all that Ellie wants. So she exploits the only thing left of value. Lev. I spoke earlier of Ellie's interior life in this fight, of the symmetry between her first kill and this moment of drowning. Another silent flashback, Joel with his guitar, Grace once again, and it is over. For Abby, it is simpler. It is nothing short of a violent baptism. Crucified, washed clean, and reborn. This is no great moment of apotheosis for Ellie, though. She is left. Finally, empty, alone, with nothing but her regret and pain to guide her, and no more defences against it, no proxy to channel the grief, just her and her anguish. When she returns to her home, she finds it empty. Her family have left her. She gave it all up in an abortive attempt to exercise demons by becoming one herself. The fingers lost in the fight, a tragic consequence of never choosing grace. Grace she only ever touched upon but never truly grasped. Exactly like Joel. Her broken plucking now just a sad shadow of what once was her connection to the inexpressible. We still have a loose end though. More than one in fact. This is the end of the game but not the end of the story. Here is where the dramatic structure is at its strongest. With such deep deep bleakness, this game needs to at least reflect some light. Because the final scene is one more flashback, a conversation that completes the night before the morning after. From the very beginning we have been asking what of Ellie and Joel's relationship. After his murder the only thing we want to know is that they at least reconciled before he died, so that at least she wouldn't have to live with that regret. And now, now after everything, We receive it. An honest connection. A real effort made to rebuild their bond. Finally. Finally. They're okay. They're okay. The decision to withhold that moment, regardless of when it happened in the narrative until the very end, is inspired. There is our emotional relief. Of course we get it at the end. That's exactly when we're supposed to get it. That is exactly when we need it most. When it has the most impact. When it means the most. That is dramatic structure done right. But that isn't all. The scene on Joel's veranda, as welcome as it is, isn't quite what it looks like. And not even Joel or Ellie know it. This feels like a reconciliation between two heroes, but of course, we know what they are really, and they make it even more clear in this scene. Joel doubles down on his actions, is incapable of regretting them, so obsessively attached is he to Ellie. And Ellie, well, Ellie, her words are more telling than Joel's. She says, I should have died on that table in the hospital, then my life would have meant something. You took that from me. Of all the ways you can react to your surrogate father damning the human race, that take is the most selfish. You see, this is not really a beautiful reconnection. 
It is a girl becoming everything her obsessive guardian is. Both statements are brutally honest and both reveal that their perspectives are dangerously inward looking. Their world is them and each other. Nothing is more important than that. An embracing of each other over the world, an admission that they would burn the world for each other in the name of reconciliation is in fact again the negation of the negation, the darkest irony hidden in the tenderest moment. And when you put that scene back where it is in the narrative, everything Ellie does for the whole game is crystal clear and inevitable. Far from being irrational, The Last of Us Part 2 has an Aristotelian logic to its action, utterly unassailable. So no, of course it isn't Schindler's List. It's better. Laugh all you want, Jim. I know I'm right. I don't think I'm overstating at all when I say this is a perfectly and intricately constructed revenge tragedy of the like the medium has never seen, of the like no one thought the medium capable, and most notoriously of the like few critics even know how to review. I'm nearly done, but I have to tell you what happens next. Because if you think there's no mileage in a sequel, you're deranged. It has already written itself. The last thing we see before the credits finally roll is Ellie leave her guitar behind and make off into the wilderness. Exactly where she is headed we do not yet know, but there is only one ultimate destination for her. She must find someone who can make a cure and sacrifice herself in the attempt to make it. It is the only thing left for her to do, and the only way she ever finds a shred of peace, and the only penance worth enough to redeem her. So I know that that is the story of The Last of Us Part 3. I am also certain that Ellie and Abby, no doubt with Lev involved, will become allies on that journey. It could not be anyone else, and I for one cannot wait to experience that. One final shot at redemption. The beautiful moment of recognition, predestined from the start, that her fate and that of everyone is in her hands, and she goes, no longer bound by her grief, to make right the great wrong that began this tragedy. Its story potential is huge, and I have zero doubt that it will be an appropriate end to what will come to be known as a true epic. Part 2's divisiveness is all tied up in the fact that this middle part of the story required a darkness, a bleakness and a moral ambivalence that drove our protagonists to the deepest recesses of the human experience, for the deeper you go, the more effective the eventual rise. It was a five-act revenge tragedy, but in the great arc of The Last of Us, it is only Act 2. If you manage to watch this whole video, then thank you. I'd say like and subscribe, but I don't know when I'll make another video. I never do. This one's just something I've needed to get off my chest for a long time, so I guess I'll see you when something else is bothering me. I just have one last note to return to something I began with, a little message to Druckmann, Straley and Wells. You make the highest quality work in the industry, work of not only intricate quality, but audacious scale, and you make millions doing it. Stop crunching your staff. The work proves that you're not the only geniuses in the building, so start showing some respect to the artists who make your work, and stop glorifying 100 hour weeks. Take a leaf out of Supergiant's book, because whilst I've spent more than 10,000 words extolling your exceptional output as a studio, I cannot completely separate the art from the artist, and neither should I, because there are artists who made this game that you, the bosses, still don't truly value. So get your fucking act together and start setting an example. Because as your next Last of Us game will prove, it's never too late for redemption. So stop being hypocrites and choose compassion. Thanks for listening everyone.